Uh, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people and their ancestors as the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting today and recognize their unique contribution to our environmental and cultural heritage, past, present, and future. So welcome to the Anzog Institute for Governance Winter Parliamentary Triangle Seminar. My name's Mark Evans, and I'm the director of the Institute. Uh, the purpose of this seminar is to provide a neutral space in which public servants, members of the public, and academics can feel free to discuss the critical governance issues confronting Australia in an open and frank way. Today's topic forms part of a broader institute project on celebrating the contribution of women to public sector excellence. And the discussion that follows is organized around today's launch of our latest report entitled, Not Yet 50-50, Barriers to the Progress of Senior Women in the Australian Public Service, which was written by Meredith Edwards, Deborah May, Bill Burmester, and myself with the support of Max Halupka. Now the, the report, as you've probably already seen, interrogates the thorny proposition that as gender equity is a key feature of a good society in late modernity, how do we achieve it and crucially sustain it in the upper echelons of the Australian Public Service? So to help us to unravel this proposition, I'm delighted to introduce our facilitator, award-winning ABC broadcaster and journalist, and of course, our very own professor, Virginia Hausager. Thank you very much, Mark, for that very, very warm introduction. Now, it's wonderful to be here, and after a long process in the preparation of, of this work and finally the report, it's fantastic to actually reach today. And I think, uh, along with Meredith and Deborah and the rest of the team, I feel a great sigh of relief. Now, Jan Mason, uh, Deputy Secretary from Finance, who you will hear from a little later, thinks I'm a bit of a sad sack. She told me so the other day because two days ago at the Board Links annual forum which Jan runs, I admitted to an audience of 150 of my most intimate friends that I take government reports to bed, to read. <laughs> my favourite being government speeches. Now, I know women of a certain age might like to take 50 shades of grey to bed, but I prefer something with a little bit more substance and something a little bit more exciting that's really going to fire me up, and I find speeches do that. But I just so happened to be reading through an old 1994 speech given by the head of then finance, Stephen Sedgwick, who's with us today, and the speech was titled Building an Equity Culture, and outlined the pressing need to implement equal employment opportunity programs. At the time, EEO had been built into the Public Service Reform Act of 84, and 10 years later, the public service managers were still trying to get their heads around the idea of equal employment opportunity, particularly in relation to employing women. And Steve's excellent speech was a rallying call of sorts, imploring his audience of mostly men to get on board and grasp the concept of equality, particular, particularly gender equality. But what struck me as I was reading this almost 20-year-old report was that, you know, if you squint a little bit at the pages and, and squint past the then uh, common vernacular, basically that same speech could be made again right now. And I'll just quote uh, Steve from that report. He said, finding the best people implies selection on merit, not simply choosing a clone of ourselves. There's an inherent danger that too limited an appreciation of the concept of merit will reinforce the status quo because of a human tendency to better understand and respect people in our own image. Now, yes, the figures have improved since back then. Back in 93, women held just 14.9% of SES positions. Women, as we now know, hold around 39%, just shy of that 40% target. But to quote the Anzog Institute report, not yet 50-50, 
The quest for gender equality in the workplace is an ongoing struggle which should not stop with the achievement of a performance target. Whilst collectively the APS is hovering around that 40% figure, some departments and agencies are dragging the ratio and the standard down with dramatically low rates of women in senior roles. Some agencies have no SES women at all, still. As you know, there are more women in the APS than men. 57% of the APS is made up of women, but the majority of senior positions are made up of men. As Martin Parkinson has said in his watershed speech last year, the figures at the top have proved stubbornly unresponsive to changes lower down. Now, he was, of course, speaking about his own department, Treasury, but that observation, with all its inherent frustrations, applies broadly across the APS. It seems we still haven't managed to get our heads around the idea or the practice of women taking an equal share of leadership and power. Now, certainly, that's the case if comments to the Canberra Times website yesterday are anything to go by. Let me quote just one of those not untypical comments in response to a story about this report yesterday. And this one's from Derek, and I quote, I spent 20 years in the APS and I never once met a female executive who could actually manage a project with any degree of competence. I don't think the female brain is wired that way. Well, Derek, I certainly hope my brain isn't wired like yours. <clears throat> it's worth just reminding you of Steve Sedgwick's rather prescient words about male managers and leaders reinforcing the status quo because of a tendency, a human tendency, to better understand and respect people in our own image. And the key word there being respect. Men who hire and promote in their own image, own image, it's that old mini-me syndrome, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Back in 2011, when I received an honorary appointment as an adjunct professor with the Anzog Institute, we set out to celebrate the contribution of women to public sector excellence, and we did, with discussion forums and a national press club event that was opened with an address by the Governor-General and telecast live on the ABC. But in celebrating women, we quickly found that the pool of senior successful women to showcase was rather shallow. Numbers were thin, and a tidal wave of gender stereotyping became very apparent. And that's what got us talking and wondering. We all know that the principal characteristics of leadership, wisdom, courage, vision, are not gender traits, nor is ambition biological. So why then has leadership traditionally been a male domain? Does gender change the focus or style of leadership? And should it? Or has an unconscious bias in the workplace encouraged women to adopt a male model of leadership? Is difference real or is it perceived? These are just some of the questions that seeded the investigation that led to that report you now have before you. In 1985, Helen Williams became the first woman to head a government department, education. Now, 28 years later, there are four women heads of government departments. Four, which is a rate in decline. Previously, there were six out of 18, which first occurred when John Howard appointed in one big swoop four new women as heads of departments, uh, secretaries of departments back in 2004. And back then, the Canberra Times very excitedly came out with a splash headline that said, it's official, the glass ceiling is shattered. Now, I know I'm a whiz at maths, but I don't think I'm the only woman in Australia to notice that one third is not equal. Nor is the current ra ratio of one out of five. To quote our former Prime Minister, gender doesn't explain everything, it doesn't explain nothing, it explains some things. But as Sharon Bell wrote recently on The Conversation Online, gender is the most powerful and pervasive lens through which our leadership narratives are read and against which we are judged. Which is why I believe the APS of all bodies must get the gender balance right for the sake of the future of our nation. Now, it's very much hoped that the Not Yet 5050 report and today's panel discussion about it will kickstart a national debate, a gender debate that we have to have. 
To begin the discussion, I'd like to now call on Meredith Edwards to give you an overview of the report's findings. Meredith is Emeritus Professor in the Anzog Institute for Governance, with a long career in both academia and public service, including many years as a Deputy Secretary in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. And Meredith has been one of the chief authors of the Not Yet 5050 report. Now, Meredith will be then followed by Deborah May, who will take us through some of the detail of the research findings. Deborah is a fellow of the Anzog Institute and an international consultant with acclaimed expertise in management and gender. And following Deborah's address, I'll then call on our panellists to join us on stage for what I anticipate will be, hopefully, a very robust discussion. And I also anticipate that a number of you will have uh, questions, so we'll have plenty of time for questions from the audience after our panel discussion. But right now, please welcome Professor Meredith Edwards. Welcome, everybody. It's great to have you here. And let's begin a debate. I want to acknowledge the traditional owners on whose land we are meeting today. My task is to provide you with an overview of our report, Not Yet 5050. Deborah May, who is a co-author uh, with the ANSOC Institute, was in, employed as a consultant on our project, and she will then, after uh, I've spoken, focus on a key part of the report where we outline and analyse what both senior men and women perceived to be the main barriers to, their, to the career progress of senior women. Why did we undertake this study? I think you've heard a little already. There are several reasons. The APS has a long-standing commitment to combat gender inequality and has done much uh, better, much better than the private sector. However, the statistical evidence is compelling. Women remain generally underrepresented in senior positions. And this is compounded in traditional male domains of activity. So gender equity and fairness are obvious reasons on their own for pursuing strategies to increase the proportion of senior women in any organisation. But as Steve Sedgwick did say uh, around 20 years ago, and Martin Parkinson much more recently, diversity in leadership and more inclusive culture are needed to improve outcomes for organisations as well as for uh, Australia's overall well-being. In other words, greater leadership diversity means better performance. However, we might know that, some of us understand that, but surprisingly, there's a stark absence of empirical studies um, of the public sector to help us understand the nature of those barriers and the perceptions about them. So, as, as you'll see in part three of our report, what the literature does uh, exist, what, is, what you can find, comes mainly from the private sector. There is, however, a 20, uh, 2011 Department of Defence review called Pathways to Change, which confronted the reality of unconscious bias, of which we'll hear more, I think, as impacting on the management judgments and leadership styles of that organisation. So we wanted to see the extent to which the findings from that agency, um, such as that one, apply to other agencies with different characteristics, notably where the proportion of senior women was much higher. So our report is path-breaking in that it's the first time there has been a survey across several departments on this issue. How did we do the research? We were aware of a 2011 Treasury study on the perceptions of senior men and women about the cultural and systemic barriers which senior women face in their recruitment and retention and promotion. And we discovered that Deborah May had been hired to undertake that survey. So, with the valuable guidance of our advisory committee, we decided to replicate it and uh, to obtain a broadly representative sample of the APS. We were lucky to get six departments who said, yes, we'll be in on this and we'll give you some money to do it. So we worked with them, large and small. They had various characteristics. Importantly, three of them had fewer than 40% of women in their SES and three of them had more than 40. So three above and three below the average. We used a mixed method approach with one-to-one -one interviews um, and focus groups. So in total, there were 250 SES and EL staff involved approximately equal numbers of senior men and women. What did we find? 
Perhaps what needs to be highlighted in what we found after a quite marked difference in uh, we found quite a marked difference in perceptions in three ways, between senior men and women, between staff in departments where men were more dominant at senior levels and those where women were more prevalent, and also between SES and EL levels. Deborah will draw out uh, um, some of those findings, uh, particularly she'll concentrate on the top 10 perceived barriers to women's career progression, looking at by gender, by level, by type of department. And that's essentially table two in the report. We found a marked difference in cultural barriers depending on the proportion of women in senior positions. Now that's important, unlike the media, particularly the Canberra Times this morning, there is a difference depending on the type of department. So where there was a prevalence of women in the SES, there was a greater acceptance of a range of leadership styles. Fitting into the culture, or cultural fit, was found to be important for success in career progression. But that meant something very different, uh, depending on whether there was a high, high proportion, relatively high proportion of women in the SES or not. In, in those departments where there was, aspiring women leaders described many more opportunities for them with greater emphasis on communication, networking skills, collegial values, and the importance of a focus on relationships. More support was also provided for family-friendly practices. Where there were relatively few women at senior levels, fitting in with a more masculine communication style and the more traditional male leadership model was expected, and a majority of these women identified gender stereotyping, style differences, and exclusion from networks as barriers they faced. Respondents were asked to rank their departments according to where they fitted in on a gender continuum, which had as its extremes exclusive and inclusive culture, and in the middle, lip service, tokenism, critical mass, and acceptance. Across all departments, women ranked their departments as closer to lip service tokenism uh, at that end of the gender continuum than, than did men. Difference in perception. So where to now? Respondents were asked for their suggestions about what their departments and the, and the APS could do to facilitate the progress of senior women. Across the board, a common set of perceptions emerged and mirrored the better practice that can be found in the literature and covered well in the defence report I mentioned earlier. Two strategic areas that stand out as relevant to all or most of the perceived barriers are committed leadership support and support and development. However, for reasons we give in the report, you need, we think we need to go beyond those to a whole suite of strategies getting to the culture of the organisation. So the report concludes with a call for our senior male leaders to lean in and listen, and then to act to, pra to practise a culture of inclusivity with accountability for results. This is not just about individual measures which might target women's development and then expect them to fit into the prevailing culture. It's also about leadership around organisational and behavioural changes which are needed for a truly inclusive culture. And only in that way are we likely to get around 50-50 senior men and women across the public service. And only then can we say that unrecognised biases no longer exist and that the merit principle for appointments to senior positions really applies. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm going to share with you now the 10 barriers that men and women across the six agencies identified as the most significant impediments to women's career progression into the SES. Now, I'm going to refer to a chart that you have in, your, in a copy of your report. I'm not going to go through all of the numbers um, individually, but you can refer to this as I go along um, and, and, uh, and keep track that way. The f what I did um, in the focus groups and interviews was ask every man and woman I interviewed for their perceptions of what um, were the barriers for women's um, progress into the SES, and these are the, these are the top ten barriers. 
The findings strongly support the conclusion that the most significant barrier, as has been said, to women's progression is the manifestation of unconscious bias and the subsequent discriminatory practices and norms that disadvantage women in particular. If you look at the barriers, the number one barrier is lack of confidence, which was identified by women across all agencies in similar numbers at the EL and SES levels, regardless of whether the agency was more gender balanced or male dominated. Strikingly, more SES women than EL women identified this as a barrier. Now, lack of confidence is described by men and women as women devaluing their skills and experiences, not feeling capable or quite ready to apply for a promotion, not knowing how to progress and balance a family, not wanting to take a risk, knowing they needed to talk themselves up, and not wanting to or knowing how. I explored this with them, and uh, the factors that they said contributed to lack of confidence were said to be feeling torn between families and careers or being penalised for having a family, lacking feedback, encouragement or mentoring, and or not having enough role models to identify with, <clears throat> receiving consistent messages that they don't fit in, Missing out on challenging work or assignments, typically because of assumptions made about them, their commitment, availability or reliability, or because they were less visible. Or suffering criticism for how they present themselves or communicate. Now I need to emphasise here <coughs> excuse me, that lack of confidence is not a consequence of women not being tough enough or not up to it, as some people concluded. It is a consequence of cultural and organisational practices and unconscious bias that results in women frequently feeling somehow not quite good enough, then underestimating their value or second guessing their choices or options. The next barrier was women's commitment to family. Most men thought that this was the single reason that women are underrepresented in the SES and explained it as a consequence of women prioritising their families over their careers. For women, however, the reasons were more varied. Women said that the expectations and norms around being in the SES included 24-7 availability or responsiveness, which is inc incompatible with family life. It meant that many chose to work at lower levels in roles that accommodated greater flexibility or that were perceived to be less demanding. Unfortunately, it also meant that many women said they were underutilised. They also said that organisational structures and systems did not support those with family responsibilities. Only 4% of SES work part-time in the APS. And this is said to be a consequence of agencies being structured in ways that limit opportunities for women and indeed men who need flexibility. There is limited creativity in job design and even though many people told me that women working part-time were often far more productive than their full-time colleagues, there was little done to harness this productive effort or indeed make it easy to sustain. Thirdly, many describe the barrier as being grounded in assumptions about women with family responsibilities or even of childbearing age that resulted in them not being provided with challenging work, challenging work or development opportunities or experiences critical to their progression. The third, um, the third barrier is career breaks, which was identified alongside family responsibilities, particularly by men and women working in male-streamed agencies. And this was despite the evidence that the women at the most senior levels in the APS are of similar ages to their male colleagues, many have children, many have taken maternity leave, in some, time, in some instances for up to two years, and a significant number have returned back on a part-time basis. They have still attained SES positions. The fourth barrier is lack of visibility. Then there's little variation in numbers between women working in male-streamed agencies or in those that are more gender balanced which reflects the implicit recognition that visibility is a prerequisite for career progression and men are much more likely to be visible or find ways to make themselves visible. Next was exclusion from informal networks, which is where there is a clear difference between women working in gender balanced agencies and those are more male dominated agencies. What is significant and illuminating here is that women in male streamed agencies identified this as a barrier in, um, at 60% and 53% of women in male streamed agencies identify this as a barrier, yet their male colleagues did not. 
Women reported that, cons that they consistently missed out on valuable information, knowledge and opportunities that were provided to their male peers informally in those agencies where there were more men. Next was personal style differences and male stereotyping. <coughs> Particularly in male-dominated agencies, authority has, as Meredith said, a masculine voice, and women rarely get it right. In addition, women are often, frequently, pigeonholed into certain types of roles, deemed more suitable for women. In agencies where there are more women, there is accommodation and acceptance of a broader range of styles, and um, women were more likely to have a broader range of roles and responsibilities. Lack of mentoring, there aren't enough senior women to be role models or mentors, people said. There are few structured mentoring programs that work and blokes are more likely to seek and find mentors than women. Inhospitable culture was clearly identified by women and indeed <coughs> SES men in male streamed agencies and that described much of what I've already um, alluded to. <coughs> Interestingly, <laughs> Um, around 40% of EL men perceived there to be no barriers at all for women's career progression. So as you see, women at AEL and SES levels identified three of the top barriers in almost equal numbers, regardless of whether they worked for male streamed or more gender balanced agencies, which suggests suggest that it is not sufficient merely to increase the numbers of women alone. What is also required in parallel is a change in our perceptions about what effective leadership is in the public service context and the development of inclusive leadership and organisational practices and cultures to ensure that women have equal access to the experiences and development opportunities required to progress. And at the moment, many don't. Opportunities are frequently dependent on visibility, executive champions and mentors, or being regarded as available, committed and responsive which advantages men. In order to really address the barriers, active, intentional leadership and cultural change is required to address unconscious bias and create inclusive workplace cultures that accommodate, accepts and indeed harnesses a range of different styles and behaviours and reduces the reliance on organisational practices that require people to not only be good at what they do, but to be good at positioning themselves and being seen to be good at what they do. The strategies um, that, that will facilitate this are outlined uh, in the report. And now I will hand over to Virginia. Now, at this part of uh, the event, we're uh, launching into a panel discussion. As I said, I'm really anticipating this to be robust and energetic, and then you will get your uh, chance and opportunity to contribute questions in the last 15 or 20 minutes or so. So let me introduce you to each of our panellists first. Now Mark Evans, who you have heard from uh, right at the beginning of uh, today's event, is the director of the Anzog Institute. He hails from the UK, if you hadn't noticed from his accent. He's a specialist in institution building and governance. And after three years of sitting on our Anzog Women's Committee, probing these issues, I believe he's probably a gender expert as well. Dr Martin Parkinson is the Secretary of Treasury and needs little introduction to you. He has a stellar career of public service to his name, but he's also made some significant inroads into the gender diversity issue by personally taking a leadership role in this area. Jan Mason is Deputy Secretary of, the, of Business Procurement and Asset Management Group in the Department of Finance and Deregulation. She's also a key founder of the Finance Women's Network and initiator of the very successful Boardlinks program, working to get more women on Australian government boards. Renee Leon is the Deputy Secretary of the Governance Group in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. And she also has a very solid public service career behind her, which includes the role of the Chief Executive of the ACT Department of Justice and Community Safety. Tony Marks is the Head of Corporate Services and CFO of Geoscience Australia, a government, a government agency that has undertaken its own tough review of gender diversity and found the organisation wanting badly its rate of SES women 
is currently sitting at zero. So it's very brave of uh, Tony to join us today. That's why I've put him right next to me so he can't dash away. <laughs> Now, I've asked each of uh, those panellists you haven't yet heard from to make some brief uh, three minutes or so opening remarks responding to today's report. They've all had an opportunity to reflect on it. And I think we'll start with you, Dr Martin Parkinson. Thanks, Virginia. Um, this is an important report on an important issue. Uh, it's very clear about what needs still to be done but I think it's important to recognise that some progress has occurred. Uh, and I'd echo um, Meredith's comments that um, the media coverage uh, of the report uh, does a disservice both to the report and to the issues of women's uh, progress. Um, <coughs> Treasury conducted uh, a systematic review, as, as Meredith said, uh, very similar to this report in 2011. And, um, we're e in eternally indebted to uh, Deb May for, um, for that work. Uh, and both our work and um, this report reaffirm that it's striking that it's not enough to have strong representation of women in the SES. Rather, um, that is a symptom of success. It's not success itself. Success is about creating a workplace culture that genuinely recognise and promotes excellence in whatever form it occurs. Now, I think it's fair to say, um, <clears throat> uh, as uh, Virginia and Meredith both e emphasised, uh, that the public service has done better than this at this than the private sector has, if you think of the private sector writ large. That doesn't mean that we can rest on our laurels. Far from it. Uh, the four issues that I'll, I want to quickly touch on today that I think are essential, um, they are similar to the pathways that are in the report, but they come directly out of uh, our own Treasury experience. Uh, first, there's a need for dedicated leadership and male champions. Um, it's men who are in the leadership positions. If men are picking people who look like them as the next generation of leaders, then the only way that's going to change is if men start to have a conversation with men. So saying that men have to be involved in this issue is not saying men have to save women. That's not it at all. Somehow it's sometimes interpreted as that, but it is only the fact that males talk to males that we are going to get enough weight around this issue. Generally, again, um, uh, I think the APS has done better than um, the private sector in this, but clearly um, there's more to be done. And you can see that in the fact that Steve, Ian Watt, David Morrison, his Chief of Army, and myself are members of Male Champions of Change, the group that Liz Broderick set up. Now, there were 23 leaders of organisations, four from the public sector, 19 from the private sector, uh, on that group, and every one of us is united on the need for change. One of the things I think that's interesting is um, and the reference to Derek, whoever poor Derek may be, um, I, I was actually going to say that, make this abstract and say whether you're in the public sector or the private sector, but let's personalise it and say, and Derek, um, if you feel that women's progression threatens your own, you need to ask yourself, do you really want a meritocracy? Is a meritocracy something that excludes half of the gene pool? I can't find any definition uh, that says merit as something that happens when you exclude half of the nation's talent. Uh, second thing I think there is uh, that's important is for organisations to make the measurement and reporting of gender diversity a mainstream issue. Again, we do that in the state of the service uh, at one level, um, and uh, Treasury and the ASX have been developing guidelines uh, that the ASX will promulgate uh, for corporations in this space. But there's more that we can do here. So um, one area that we've tried to do more on in Treasury is after appointment rounds, we now report to staff the number of applicants, the number of people who are interviewed, and the number of successful candidates, all split with a gender um, dimension on each of those. 
uh, and we intend to move to um, reporting the gender split of performance appraisal results and the resulting pay outcomes. Uh, and we'll be doing that after the performance round that we're, we're finalising at the moment. I think the third element that's important uh, is continual dialogue and engagement within the organisation. You've got to broaden accountability away from the leadership team. The last thing you want is a situation where the people who are opposed to progress think, I'll just wait this person out. They're on a frolic. Um, one of the things that has been great in Treasury, uh, and, uh, and Deb <coughs> took us on this journey, is that the Treasury Executive Board, there is not a chink of light between us. And a number of the board members are here today. And I think that's actually been really powerful for us in the message that we're sending to staff. We can't tell staff what to think. We can tell them what we believe in, and we can tell them how we expect them to behave in the workforce. And I think we've got to keep doing that all the time. Uh, finally, I think the last thing that, that I'd point to is a need to develop um, a culture in the organisation that isn't about women succeeding, it's about all people of merit succeeding. Uh, and I think that was touched on in the, in the earlier comments. We need to genuinely accept difference, um, whether that be in regard to leadership styles or about assumptions around willingness of capacity of staff with different family commitments or external commitments to our own. We need to be careful not to presume that because somebody has a particular set of arrangements, they are unwilling or unable to step up and take on um, additional roles. And this is something, from our experience, um, we saw a lot of around flexible work. Uh, our senior leaders were seeing people working flexibly and were saying, well, we've got this time critical task, we can't really ask them because that person's made a decision to work part time or to work flexibly and I don't want to impose on them. Well, actually, it's not the manager's decision, it's a joint decision and if you don't ask, you'll never find out. Uh, work Changing workplace culture is a long and difficult process. It will take time for this to flow through. We have not yet see, seen the results coming through uh, in Treasury in a, in a big way in terms of uh, SES outcomes. We have appointed um, our first female um, band three. Now the Treasury's been in existence for 112 years. We've appointed our first uh, in, the, in recent months. It's only taken us 112 years. Uh, what we can see, though, already is um, a pickup in the number of women um, coming into the EL2 cohort. Uh, so I don't know whether that, you know, be, being an economist, I'm not going to say that's statistically significant yet, but we can see it. Uh, and the important thing is um, uh, it, to recognise it'll take time. You cannot slacken off. Uh, you've got to keep pushing it. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a journey that's well worth undertaking. Certainly 112 years, one, uh, look, you know, 224 years, we might even have two at Band 3. I'm joshing her. I, I think we can do that. <laughs> I think we can, and I'm sure you will. Jan Mason. Thanks very much, Virginia. Um, how's the sound? Okay? Yeah, good. Good. Um, look, I I'd like to start with an admission. Um, Finance has been working for over 20 years uh, towards getting women into leadership positions in equal numbers. And we haven't yet succeeded. Um, we are still working on it. We certainly should be proud of the progress that we've made, and, and Martin made the point, uh, that compared with the private sector, the public sector is demonstrably doing quite well. But in finance, we, we don't yet think that we've succeeded and there is much more that's still to be done. And the fact that we may be ahead of some other agencies gives me um, little room for comfort. So I'd just like to start with that admission. The recent ANZOG research has confirmed some of the research done internally within finance and uh, it shows certain things and I won't go over all of the results because I think Deborah and Meredith have already covered some of this. but. In finance, the things that are perceived to accelerate career advancement include uh, working long hours and working full time, 
and, and also having a broad set of skills and experiences. Some of the bottlenecks to progression in finance that are perceived are a lack of turnover and mobility, silos within the organisation that relate in part to the, the diversity of the work that we do within finance, bias and assumptions in the minds of those doing the selection processes for senior executive roles, and uh, varied and more limited opportunities across business groups for promotion. And some of that relates to the environment and just to correct a myth Finance is not immune from the sort of resource constraints being faced by many other agencies across the APS. So we too wear um, some of the pain and that does limit at the moment opportunities for career progression for women and men. Uh, some of the critical success factors for women in finance are perceived to be delivering on a tough or challenging project and encouragement from a senior officer. I would here note that Encouraging somebody costs very little, pretty much nothing. It's an easy thing for a manager to do, to spot raw talent in women or men and to offer a word of encouragement. It certainly goes a long way. Um, look, we've already put in place some strategies from the internal research that we did in finance and some of those include having a gender action plan, um, appointing an executive board champion for women in the organisation, that would be me, and I'm very happy to wear that badge of honour within the organisation. We also collect and monitor gender information by level and we report that to the department's executive board and to managers throughout the organisation on a quarterly basis. Well, we've also started some really useful discussions within the organisation on approaches to the sorts of issues identified in the research and some of those discussions have involved the department's executive board, uh, the champion for women, which also includes me, of course, and uh, the women's network in finance, which incidentally has been operational and active for over 20 years. It was established under the then Secretary of Finance, uh, Stephen Sedgwick, who is here and now Public Service Commissioner. So Steve has a track record of commitment to this objective and a track record of achievement, which I would like to credit. But I'd also like to mention that uh, the Finance Women's Network, aside from being active for over 20 years, has been supported by successive secretaries of the department, starting with Steve, but followed by Peter Boxall, Ian Watt, and now David Tune. Each of them has demonstrated a strong commitment to the Women's Network, including through the allocation of real money. So every year, the Finance Women's Network has had an allocation of money within the department from our scarce resources to undertake activities in support of women within the organisation. One of our recent events has included a discussion between three deputy secretaries in the department and Deborah May, who is one of the co-authors of the ANZOG report. And that uh, session, sponsored by the Finance Women's Network, actually involved a discussion with staff about what unconscious bias looks like and why it is important for the organisation to address it. That was a really useful discussion. Uh, current areas of further activity include initiating conversations with all SES within the organisation about uh, perceived and actual barriers to uh, women's participation and the impact of unconscious bias, empowering women and men to discuss, to discuss flexible working arrangements and options that might suit their own circumstances. And I would note that many of the things that have been put in place in finance over the years uh, by the Finance Women's Network or initiated by the Finance Women's Network have been of equal benefit to men within the organisation. And we now find that when we have women's network activities, it's not a sea of women in the audience only, we see more and more when men turning up to these events and being very happy to be there to support the Women's Network and seeing themselves also benefiting from its activities. Um, just skipping over my notes, conscious of the time. Uh, look, all of this is, is quite good stuff and it may actually continue to assist us to make incremental progress, that is slow progress. Uh, but I think it's probably time for some more decisive action. And one of the things I've um, been thinking about, and it's not yet a decision, so uh, I would need to stress that, but 
Within finance, we're actually looking at whether we make sure that all of our SES selection panels contain at least 50% women, which if we had a three-person panel would mean uh, two women and one man, or if a four-person panel, then it would be you know two of each. And no, I wouldn't count the scribe when I'm um, <laughs> when I'm doing that calculation. And I think if what we're saying is that part of the problem is an inability to recognise and credit the different leadership styles of women, if there are more women on selection panels, then I think we've got a greater chance of actually being able to see that talent, being able to see uh, the difference, and perhaps um, seeing more women making their way through those merit selection processes. There is scope, I think, for that idea to be broadened and adopted by more organisations, so I'll just toss that one out there. Um, and finally, if I comment that, you know, finance does really well at the band three level. We've got a six person leadership team for the department that's obviously led by the secretary. Uh, we've got five band threes, four of whom are women. And that's fantastic, but we do not so well at the band two level where we have only 13.6% women in our band two ranks, so clearly we're lagging well behind the rest of the APS. At, the rest of the APS as at December 2012 was 38%. And at the band one level, um, we're not doing quite so badly there. We've got 38.8% women as at December 2012 compared with 40.1% for the APS as a whole. So we've got a way to go in finance. We are determined to work on it and I um, I start from the very simple proposition that women and men are equally capable of, of fulfilling a, role, a range of roles in society and if we're not achieving something approximating 50-50 then clearly the merit principle is not correctly applying and the challenge then becomes how do we address the dysfunction that prevents merit from applying? And when people talk about quotas and targets, and I must say I'm more of an advocate for a target than a quota, uh, a lot of women become concerned because what they worry about is the thought that they may be getting a job because they're a woman and because there is a quota, not because they're the best person for the job. Women want promotion on merit. I don't hear the guys being concerned about the fact that a lot of them are currently not getting jobs on merit, which is demonstrably the case while ever we're short of 50-50. So until we've reached that, I won't be satisfied and we'll keep working at it. Terrific, thank you very much, Jan. We'll move uh, straight on to um, Tony. Plenty of food for thought there and um, I think Jan's hit on a few things that uh, your very organisation, Geoscience Australia, has been looking at too. Thank you, Virginia. Um, so Geoscience Australia statistics aren't presented in the not yet 50-50 report and I'd like to just quote a few of those to provide some context, particularly after your opening remarks. So, Virginia, kind remarks, I think they're called. Kind and, remarks. Uh, and some points of difference. GA is a small applied science agency with a highly educated and a male dominated workforce. Two thirds of our staff are men. Around 90% of our staff have tertiary qualifications of which 22% of those are PhDs, compared with around 2% across the broader APS. So we're therefore a highly analytical workforce from the traditional male domain of earth sciences. In industry, female geologists and geophysicists represent only 15% of the workforce. Now this is important because it provides some plausible reasons for the overall underrepresentation of women across our workforce. It also illustrates one of the arguments used to reason away women's underrepresentation, And it provides an insight into the challenge to change the culture. And this cultural change, we believe, must be around broad acceptance that unconscious bias does exist at GA, and it has and does impede women's career progression. The gender imbalance is even more pronounced at senior levels. None of our seven SES positions uh, are occupied by women. Only 15% of our science group leaders are women, and only a quarter of, of our EL ranks are women. So despite the traditionally low industry representation, 
earth science graduates have for many years now been 50-50 and despite GA hirings um, over the past year being around 50-50, only 10% of EL2 recruits were women. So it was apparent to the CEO and I that their widely held view or myth that we'll get there in time needed to be tested. So GA consulted with the Treasury uh, regarding its review and soon after engaged Deborah to undertake a cultural audit to investigate the barriers to progression of female staff. And we ran a very uh, in-depth exercise with Deborah who spoke to some 250 of our 750 staff across all divisions and all levels. Uh, so we have a very deep sample obviously and um, while our results showed a lot of similarities to the not yet 50-50 report agencies in terms of perceptions around inclusiveness or lack thereof, there are some notable differences. Male stereotyping was identified as a more significant barrier at GA than elsewhere. The exclusion from informal networks was also more pronounced, particularly as identified by more senior staff. I mean, in short, uh, it demonstrated that we had a very blokey culture. The results highlighted that many of our workplace practices favoured men, especially those who have worked at GA for many years and have an established network and profile within the agency. Many decisions rely on individual perceptions and assumptions made by supervisors and peers and can be informed by unconscious bias and stereotyping, as we've heard. The result of this is that women at GA also are often overlooked and excluded from fully contributing, participating or progressing at GA. So our response to this uh, report, which we just received uh, in May, is that the CEO and the executive were surprised and also disappointed by some of the findings. Uh, but there's a strong commitment to make changes to address all of these issues. The CEO will shortly be addressing all staff, highlighting the issues, seeking to educate staff on unconscious bias, and articulating the commitment of our leadership group to an inclusive culture. Of the 30 odd recommendations which have been accepted by the executive, a number of initiatives have already been put in place, such as changes to recruitment to make uh, female panel members mandatory, not just recommended, uh, all uh, internal vacancies must be uh, advertised internally as an expression of interest and we're going to introduce unconscious bias training specifically into our leadership programs. An internal reference group has been established to champion and promote the issues and strategies uh, and these um, will be published and reported against. Other strategies include improvements to performance management processes generally uh, and a focus on career development, mentoring and coaching talented staff. So we recognise that there will be a wide variety of reactions, analytical and emotional, from our staff, men and women, but the executive is committed to the long-term leadership challenge of removing barriers to women's equal access, participation and representation. Terrific. Thank you, Tony. We'll pass on to Renee. Thanks, Virginia. Uh, PM&C is, uh, is not suffering from the inability to reward women and recognise their achievement by promotion uh, because we've got a majority of women in the Band 2 and Band 3 cohort and in fact um, a couple of my colleagues are here and will attest to the fact that the men around the executive table are starting to have that experience many of us have had of being kind of in a significant minority mm -hmm. uh, in the room, which I think is probably pretty good for them to know what that feels like. Mm -hmm. um, five out of our seven deputies are uh, women and uh, we're led by Dr Watt, who's one of the male champions of change. So I think the numerical issue isn't what we struggle with. I think the issues for PM&C are reflected in the, and they're relevant to the findings of this report, are reflected in the latest state of the service data, where we have nearly three times as many people reporting that they work more than 90 hours per fortnight, and significantly fewer people who feel satisfied with their work-life balance than the broader APS. And of course that's relevant to the extent to which 
the, uh, our predominantly young and female workforce is able to effectively balance work and family responsibilities. So family commitments came up very high for PM&C in the, in the barriers to women's progression. Not, I think, that PM&C is making assumptions that women won't be able to do it, but that women are looking at the workload and the work-life balance and uh, are self-selecting out from wishing from being in positions where they just will not be able to manage their commitment to their family responsibilities. Now, having said that, I don't think that we are without um, initiative on that respect. So we've got a couple of our SES women work part time and are well supported in doing that. We've adopted a policy and a practice of enabling women who work part time at the EL and SES level to have uh, someone who acts for them on the day or days that they're not there so that you don't end up with the experience that I'm sure many women managers have had of doing your whole job in 70% uh, of the time. And uh, also we've produced and are in the process of putting out a toolkit with kind of practical case-based studies and scenarios of how to put all those nice policies about work-life balance into effective action. How to make family responsibilities gel in a practical sense with work so that we don't have what's often the mindset around people wanting to work more flexibly of, well, that wouldn't work in this job, instead changing it to how can we make this work? And that's a, a journey that Dr Watt, the Secretary, is very supportive of us taking. Uh, we also have equipped all of our SES staff with the best technology we can so that they can be present when they're not present. Uh, because of that very high workload and unpredictable workload in the department, we don't want it to be the case that women who uh, need to be home during family hour can't participate in important projects or be available when they're needed. And so we have got as best possible technological access remotely so that you can be there even if you're not there. Uh, of course, I hope we won't mean that people are there when they're not there all the time, but that is the intention that you can go home and see your children but still contribute to what needs to be done at the office. Uh, the third area where I think the report reflects something that we see at work all the time is that need for women to have access to uh, the role modelling of women in senior positions and to their mentoring input. I mentor and always have mentored a couple of uh, more junior women and one of the things I often find that relates to the report is that perfectly capable and competent women wonder whether they'll succeed at the next level and I think PM&C's fortunate that we've got both enough senior women to show that you can succeed, but also it's important that senior women actively take the time to mentor other women coming up through the ranks to encourage them to make the, make the um, effort to get there and also to ask for and expect the adjustments to their workload and work-life balance that they need in order to be able to do it effectively. So I don't think in any sense, as um, Martin said, one can never rest on one's laurels. We um, now have, much belatedly compared to finance, a women's network, and it's immediately uh, reached 100 members, which is a significant proportion of our organisation and has an active program of events designed to uh, provide information and support and encouragement for women. It was launched by Dr Watt on International Women's Day and I think it's another one of those ways in which we expressly say to the women of the organisation that they are as valued a part of the organisation and as expected to succeed uh, irrespective of gender. Terrific. Thank you very much, Renee. Now, I want to jump straight in and uh, tackle the issue of unconscious bias, and we're going to start with you, Mark, at your end on that, unconscious bias. But just before I do, I want to thank all of you for speaking so frankly uh, about your departments and agencies and situations. Um, we didn't ask you here today just to interrogate you all for a show and tell, but rather because you've all been through this issue in depth and uh, have have therefore, I think, come up with uh, all sorts of interesting solutions, practical solutions, but also plenty to share, and that's what this afternoon is very much about. So thank you for that and for that honesty as well. Mark, throughout the period of this research, uh, there's been a lot of discussion at ANZOG at the Institute about unconscious bias. What is it? What does it mean? Is it actually conscious? You know, is there such a thing as unconscious or is it really conscious? 
Given your international um, expertise as well, and you've come at this from a slightly sort of outside perspective, what do you make of the claim of unconscious bias? Well, I don't think it's peculiar to, um, to the Australian Public Service. Um, most organisations are underpinned by dominant norms and values that um, promote certain behaviours. Um, and if you want to be part of the club, then you have to exhibit those behaviours. Um, and actually what was quite interesting um, in terms of our report was um, the way in which there's actually a silent, um, what I would call a silent minority of men who aren't members of the boys club, right? Um, the classic quote was, um, I really like my colleagues, but I'd like to spend some of my weekends at home with the kids. Mm. Um, so, so we have to remember the way in which organisational forms of a whole range of different types do mm. privilege certain norms and, and values um, mm. and promote certain behaviours. And that's why this problem really is about affecting a culture shift. Mm. And that culture shift is, cannot be done from the top down. Um, it has to have a very strong bottom-up mm. component to it as well. Because you won't get the change in behaviour through reform alone. You have to win hearts and minds. You have to affect meaningful change through behaviour itself. Let, let's just have a little look at what that means and how you do that. And Martin, I, I want to come to you on this. I noticed in, in you've said before in, in your speech last year that you know this is not a new problem. We've been aware of this for 15 years and yet you, know, you say today we've still got some way to go. Um, how, how do you shift this, this bias or unconscious bias and how do you make um, cultural change within an organisation particularly one that's 112 years old? Um, it's a really good question. Uh, with, with hindsight... I might just get you to hold it up a little. Sorry. Um, with hindsight, what we... Um, the mistake we were making was we were um, responding to symptoms. Um, we, were looking, we were putting in place uh, ad hoc responses. So we'd done a lot to encourage um, uh, part-time work, flexible work. Uh, I think amongst the three centrals, um, we have the highest proportion. Um, uh, Wind Finance uh, uh, sponsored a uh, childcare centre in the building. Uh, we did a whole pile of things, but they were one-offs. And <coughs> we, we started from the presumption, which um, I think geosciences uh, were starting from too, which is, well, partly this is, uh, it's a cohort problem. Mm. And, you know, we'll just get... With time it will with change. With time it'll fix itself. And there are some things we can do to hasten this, like flexible work and childcare and like. Um, not recognising that what's really going on here is the interaction of a whole series of really subtle attitudinal um, issues that, that come together in such a way as to create uh, an environment which uh, doesn't allow people to, to progress. But, but how do you shift that? I mean, well, as Mark well, said, it's us, got to be from bottom, as yeah. well as top down, bottom up. Yeah, so for us, and I suspect given the analytic nature of, of Mark's um, uh, organisation, uh, you, you'll, you'll see, you've got to find the right buttons to push. Now, we talked about this, uh, and um, people were quite happy to have a conversation about it, but actually putting data for a bunch of Treasury people, mm. putting data out there so that they could all take the data and interrogate it themselves mm. and in fact convince themselves that this was an issue is what turned things around, I think. Um, we've just got our uh, flash state of the service uh, survey results for just for the organisation. We've got 81% of the staff um, are supportive of the Progressing Women Initiative. Uh, we got 7% opposed. I thought 7%, that's a lot less than I expected. Um, but uh, I think the single biggest thing that we did was actually uh, get, so we set up an inclusive workplace committee. Uh, we've got some externals on that. Sue Varden, uh, who many of you will know, and Rachel Cobb, who's the managing director of GE Retail Solutions. Uh, 
And we've had each of our five groups, our four policy groups and our um, corporate area, go through and look at the data about women's progression, about performance appraisal results, about um, uh, pay outcomes and the like on a group by group basis at a great level and these have been done by teams within those groups that have not been led by the executive directors, as the deputy secretaries, they've been led by the staff and they have convinced themselves this is a problem uh, that, and that we have to fix it. It's very interesting though because what you're saying, suggesting is that it's the data that's made the shift. Now, be, because bias, particularly when it comes to gender, can be a value-based thing. Like Derek from the commenting on the Canberra Times just doesn't believe women are wired a certain way. Are you suggesting that the data is enough to change people's thinking and therefore what, the way they value a worker? Uh, I think it goes... Um, well. It's not enough just to rely on data, and we don't have time to go through. I've done a list. There's about 10, 10, 12 different things that we've done, all of which I think are helping to contribute to this. But um, we didn't have any evidence that there was conscious, systematic attempts to hold women back. Um, it's that subtle, complex interplay of um, partly about the way in which we design jobs, partly about the way in which we organise the, the way in which the department operated. You know, it's pretty simple not to have um, meetings uh, at times when people can't, not all people can get there. Mm. Uh, you know, but you get into this, you get into these sort of uh, cultural norms. Mm. Um, and, and indeed, um, we were talking with uh, some people who are looking at another organisation this morning and one of the issues that that, uh, that was mentioned there is there's a whole series of social taboos in, within that organisation. And it made me think, partly what got us into this situation is we probably had a whole series of taboos or norms um, that nobody ever challenged because for people like me, um, we grew up in the organisation, you just accepted yes. them. Uh, a very important gotta, point. I think you've got to find the right button mm. and for an analytic organisation, because people aren't driven by this sort of sense that women aren't equal to men, they just didn't believe there was a problem. Mm. Uh, so, so you have to find a way to convince them, That's a, yeah, let them convince themselves. I want to move on to the issue of lack of confidence and self-belief. As we heard from Deborah, this was rated very highly by both EL women and SES women as a barrier to, to progress. Now, Renee, I want to throw this over to you, and look, I'd like to hear everyone's response to it, but it, there is a hint here, a, a dangerous hint, that the problem is with women if they lack confidence. What's your take on that? So I should say at pm and I never see any great lack of women's confidence. You know, it's a Good. pretty <laughs> confident, successful, <laughs> assertive bunch of women around the table. So uh, I think what I would say is that uh, it's it's less likely to be that it's sort of a problem with women. But, you know, if, you, if you've grown up as a girl and all your life you've been kind of subtly compared as not being quite good enough, it wouldn't take very much for you to take negative performance feedback and failure at getting a promotion as sort of confirming something you think the society might have been telling you all along. Uh, and I think we all have seen research that shows that uh, men are probably overconfident about how ready they are for promotions. And I know I've interviewed quite a lot of men who were overconfident <laughs> about their readiness. Um, and yet women are more likely to not try for a promotion until they feel they can already do the job instead of doing what a, a lot more men do, which is just kind of go for it and see what happens. And we do have a cultural... Uh, backdrop against which there is much more encouragement of risk-taking and adventure by boys and much more encouragement of be nice and fit in by girls. Now, obviously, we're not all stereotypes and there's plenty of adventurous risk-taker women in pm and and everywhere else, but I think those cultural backdrops mean that there is... Uh, that if they are reinforced by being sort of subtly or not so subtly put down at work, mm. it wouldn't take long for women mm. to think, oh, maybe I really can't cut it here. Mm. Jan, what's been your experience and in your department regarding women and, and confidence and self-belief? Um, I agree with uh, everything that Renee said. Basically, I've seen a lot over the years of women who set very high standards for themselves 
and will not put themselves forward for promotion until they're absolutely confident that they can satisfy every single selection criterion to a high standard. They'll go through and they'll go, I can do one, two, three, um, I'm not sure about four, I haven't actually had that experience, so I won't apply. Whereas a guy will go, oh, I've done one, I've done two, oh, I can wing it on three, uh, I'll give it a go, what's to lose? And so men are a bit more inclined to take those risks and put themselves forward. And so, but how, how do you encourage women to get over that, to not be so concerned well, about not having all the competencies required? Well, I would actually like people applying for jobs to have the competencies because <laughs> <laughs> we actually do want people who are ready to step up. But I guess taking a little bit of a risk that you may not get up you know, the first time you apply is something that more women need to do. And I guess if I think of my own life experience, picking up on a point that Renee made, um, one of the, the messages that plays in my mind that I think has served me well in my career is that I had a father who said to me, and I'm one of six children and only one of them was a boy, so probably it was in his interest to think this way, but he, he used to say to me, girls can do anything. And that's the message that I carried with me through my life, that girls can do anything. And if you have that message rather than a, a more negative one, I think it gives you an advantage. So I probably was a bit more of a risk taker than some other women might be inclined to be. Is and the other risk point, reward, oh, reward? May I just make one more point? Is about the positive feedback from senior managers too, that that can help women and men overcome a sort of lack of self-belief. Sorry, Virginia. No, no, I, I was just going to ask, is risk rewarded though for women all the time? And Meredith, I'm going to throw this over to you because I know you've made speeches in the past, uh, or just recently, um, about your very early time in uh, as a public servant when your style was, uh, well, those around you tried to reshape your style because they thought you were too ballsy, too forward, and you didn't smile enough. <laughs> She's smiling now. <laughs> I wasn't nice enough wasn't nice enough. And yet if you're nice enough, you're seen as too soft. And I sort of was semi-conscious of that. But I was in a very blokey culture, uh, in social security at the time. And I was, it wasn't just that I was a woman, but I did feel, because I was the only senior woman in that department, that I was alone and very isolated. But I think it was uh, also because I was doing something that was not very popular. It was the child support scheme which Social Security did not want to have anything to do with. So it was a combination of factors that was affecting me. But, but did you feel the need to actually have to remould yourself or, or you know, man up a little so bit? So I had this uh, minister who wanted me to do well and I was, his actually, I was actually his ministerial advisor. So, but working in the department, which was a bit of an unusual relationship, he said, he took me out to dinner and um, proceeded to tell me what my strengths and weaknesses were. And uh, my weaknesses I do remember well. And I was um, intimidating and I was, I was quite aggressive, um, a bit defensive, sensitive. So I took these comments to heart. He wanted me to do well in a really blokey culture. He said, look, the guys are really paternal. That's their attitude, and you want to get promoted there, so you've got to be more, you've got to be nice to them, you've got to smile at them. So you can understand it was very difficult to work out my leadership style. I did a self-assessment. One of my main lessons was learning to um, not only assess yourself and have more self-awareness, but to understand how others were perceiving you. Once you knew that, you could sift and then work out what you could change and what you couldn't. But I was a passionate um, reformer. I wanted to make change. Mm. And I, over time, by the time I got to PM&C, I'd mellowed enough to know that process was as important as the outcome. And you'd learn to be nice. <laughs> Sometimes. Is, how, in, how important to all of you uh, is, is style? And I think this is something that's come up during this research uh, a number of times about leadership style and whether or not women need to reshape the way that they do things or mould themselves um, uh, in a sort of more manly way. It's that old double bind, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't. You know, you can be too soft, as Meredith says, or be, be tough and be considered too aggressive and too ballsy and uh, too frightening. 
So how important is style um, or is it no longer an issue in the APS? Martin, I'll throw that over to you. <laughs> I, I was hoping you'd ask someone else first. <laughs> um, I want to say it's not important, um, but uh, I can think of instances in Treasury in the last, um, I'll go back a little while, so I'll say over the last decade, where um, the rap on individual women from other women and from men um, has basically been focused on their style and not on their substance. And uh, I have to say, I, I find that quite frustrating. Um, uh, now, I, I, I hear it less now, but I don't know whether that's because I'm further away from where those conversations are, are taking place. Um, but I, I, we know that different leadership styles actually add to the effectiveness of an organisation. And I think uh, as leaders, we actually have to go out and say clearly to staff that different styles are complementary. Um, I don't want, well, let, let, me, let me personalise a bit. When I joined Treasury in 1981, walking down the corridor was like walking down, um, walking through a football club locker room with testosterone slopping around your ankles. <laughs> It's a horrible, it's a horrible mental picture. Awful. It's a horrible <laughs> mental picture, but I was part of the, that silent proportion of males who didn't like that. Um, and it was people like um, Chris Higgins and Ted Evans in their own way, who, and David Morgan to some extent, Bernie Fraser, others, who actually went out of their way to try and start to change that. Um, and then, you know, Others of us came along and built on that. Um, I, I think we are in a much better position, but style in those days was, if you didn't, and you used the term a moment ago, man up. If you didn't man up in Treasury um, and get out there on the sporting field at lunchtime, then, um, you know, what was wrong with you? Mm. Uh, and I think uh, we're, it, it's good for us as an organisation that we are 30 years um, beyond that uh, but I don't think uh, it's fair to say that we've totally eliminated style as an issue that people talk about. Um, but I hope it's definitely not an issue that influences us when we make decisions about um, who to promote and who to provide opportunities to. Uh, Renee's uh, about Virginia, to jump. Can I um, step in on the converse to that? So I think style is actually really important to leadership and a lot of what we call expected leadership behaviour are styles of leadership that we ought to either reward or not reward. I guess what I'd be interested, what I think is that there is a, a greater bandwidth of style that men are allowed to occupy than women are and that what we ought to be doing is taking our focus off women's leadership style, is it good enough, and turning a bit more focus onto men's leadership style and the extent to which behaviour that really ought not to be acceptable is accepted when it comes from men. And so that the kind of interrupting people when they're speaking, uh, using up all of the oxygen in the room, uh, <laughs> uh, being rude and aggressive, being uh, directive and uh, poor communicators, things that if women do them, they're shrill and bitches, but if men do them, they've kind of manned up and they're, well, they're a bit assertive, but a bit aggressive, but they get things done, so we forgive all of that for them. So I guess I'd like to see a bit more spotlight put on unacceptable male leadership style, which at the moment we tolerate or reward, and a bit less on is women's leadership style good enough? Absolutely. Fascinating point. Really great point, Jan. Um, I just wanted to say, I think um, the requirements of today's public service are playing more to the sorts of styles that are commonly attributed by women or um, portrayed by women. Uh, the requirement for us to be good at stakeholder management, the requirement for us to consult, the requirement for us to not just talk but listen. I think a lot of those are very, those requirements are very compatible with styles that are actually uh, displayed often by women and more and more men I think are required to start learning some of those leadership styles. 
It's a very interesting point because hasn't that been made, in fact I think you made a very similar point Martin yourself in your speech last year that with a changing world and the increasing pressures and the myriad complex pressures on any organisation now we need the diversity of, of style and approach. Absolutely. Absolutely and just um, I mean I don't want to be a male and come across as being defensive and interrupting Renee um, but I <laughs> Totally, but I no, no, I know I'd better not. <laughs> I, I know who will lose that argument. <laughs> um, what, what I was, I wasn't saying that style's not important. What I was saying is that um, I hope uh, we are not looking at styles, uh, leadership styles that may be more associated with women, and thinking of those as something that is as a negative. Um, I agree entirely that uh, leadership style is absolutely critical. We do not want to be promoting people whose leadership styles are inimic inimical to the sustainability and success of the organisation. Uh, and there are still instances around of people at senior levels who have styles that, in my view, are unacceptable in the, in the modern workplace. Um, and that's you know, public and private sectors, so I'm not pointing fingers anyway. Uh, and I think um, you know, one of the sectors that we in Treasury have a lot of exposure to is the finance sector, and that is that and the mining sector are just screaming examples of um, behaviours that just would not be tolerated in the, in the public sector. Um, well, what, what's interesting at the same time is uh, the importance of looking at the relationship between the political world and the bureaucratic world. So out there in the political world, the focus is on short-termism, crisis management, media management, which actually emphasises some really quite masculine type traits. Mm. And of course, mm. you know, in my view, the appalling treatment of Julia Gillard and the way in which her personality was structured through the media um, exemplifies that. So, so I suppose there's a bit of confusion in my mind that we're saying that actually the big problems that we're confronting at the moment in public policy require a more adaptive, empowering type of leadership. But the key messages that have been sent out through the political world are the importance of focusing on the short-term, quick fixes, macho, silverback type management. So there seems to be some really quite significant contradictions there. I think it's a fascinating point and it does pick up on a Australian cultural thing that you've, uh, you've noted there, a, a very sort of, well, it's been said a number of times recently, a very sexist culture, but it certainly comes through our media and the way we do uh, chop up um, understandings of, of policy and of politics in very short sound bites in a way that you do have to be very outspoken, masculine and aggressive to get your message across, without a doubt. Uh, and we've seen that play out very much in recent politics. I'm going to take questions from the audience now. If you do, we've got a couple of m microphones roaming. If you do have a question, please pop your hand up. We've got a few minutes for questions and someone will bring a microphone to you. And if you wouldn't mind introducing who you are and where you're from. So pop your he uh, hand up for a, uh, a question. And just while we're waiting for one of those, I want to raise the issue of the merit principle. Uh, this is something that confuses me, I must say. It's raised all the time that uh, employment promotion is all about merit in the public service and uh, merit, of course, is sacrosanct. If that's the case, uh, either the merit principle is flawed or women aren't as capable as men because we don't have equal representation in leadership positions. So would someone like to pick up on that point? Martin, I had a feeling you might. <laughs> Look, um the merit principle is sacrosanct. The issue is, what is merit? Um, and it goes back to the issue I, I made, a comment I made at the outset about men talking to men. If men think that merit is um, them, and so merit is replicating them, uh, then you will get the same situation we have now being repeated into the future. Uh, part of the point of, um, uh, part of the reason why I'm attracted to the male champions uh, process is because it, it's, it's not a vehicle for the 23 of us to say to others, you should do what we're doing. It's an opportunity for the 23 of us to share experiences to see how we can do it better ourselves and that others who want to join 
can see what we're doing and come along on the journey. Uh, but critically, it goes to the issue of how do you define merit? And if defining merit is you've got to look like me, well, I'm sorry, I don't regard that as merit. Mm. The old mini-me principle. Tokenism and lip service is also something that came up quite a lot through this research uh, in the one-on-one -on -one interviews. And I know that's something that uh, came up through the geoscience um, review as well, with women, a lot more women in your study than men, uh, saying, look, all of this talk, not just about merit, but also about flexibility, is tokenism. It's lip service. Um, that is right. That's what, the, what our results showed. And um, I'd just like to... Uh, also reiterate uh, what Martin said about merit and I think it's very clear in the results that we've seen what does merit actually look like at the interview panel and the responses uh, from women were that the culture at uh, interview panels reflected the broader organisational culture and uh, you know there were some specific comments about uh, going into the into the room and kind of knowing straight away look like you know I don't want to be here and this isn't going to work for me so Whatever actually it is that's, that's taking place as part of that culture is clearly uh, visible. In terms of the um, tokenism, like other government agencies, we have a you know, wonderful suite of um, access to flexible working arrangements and so forth. One of the things that, uh, that I can say was shocking uh, to our CEO was that uh, for him dealing with his executive and a number of us uh, have young children and, um, and and other caring responsibilities. We actually do have access to a lot of flexibility, um, and so what was very surprising was what's going on that this isn't actually getting pushed down in the rest of the organisation. We've actually got the policies. The very leader of the organisation um, openly demonstrates his commitment to those values with his executive team, but. The, you know the results identify it's not happening through the rest of the organisation and being and pushed down. So, but why is that? Is that because uh, the few women that you do have don't feel that they can take up the opportunity to use those flexible arrangements because it might somehow penalise them? Well, that, that's certainly what the uh, what the perception is, and um, we're really sort of still at the point of trying to uh, explore why that is. Um, certainly, the unconscious bias though is, uh, is the issue at, at GA and one of the other examples um, uh, that we got a lot of information from was even um, managers which are largely male as I've said self-identifying that they're not good at giving performance be uh, feedback. We had some comments uh, coming through from women as well saying you know um, my manager appears afraid to give me direct feedback I think he thinks I'll cry and kind of run off home if I'm given the true message, which of course I wouldn't. So, um, you know, so there... So there's something there also about the messages that that manager is giving too, about, um, you know, uh, how tough he can be or not. Well, yes, I think that's right. Um, and as I say, so I think the challenge for us now is, you know, is really to try and... Uh, and it, it's going to take some time to coach people and train people in the organisation to actually understand and identify that, that these issues mm. do exist. The issue, uh, do we have a question from the audience? Not at the moment, oh, we do. Have, has the microphone come your way? Thanks. Uh, Russell Ayres from the Department of Education, Employment, Workplace Relations. Um, when I go over my mind in nearly 30 years in the public service, I think a lot of the women that I've worked with, there's been generational sort of change and difference. Uh, the women that I first started in the public service, I recall having some disappointments about the senior women that they, the very few senior women that they had to uh, look up to. I'm curious to know if there is a a sense of generational difference now between young women and more senior women as much as I perceived there was 30 years ago? It's a really interesting question. Renee, I might throw that over to you to start off with. Well, since the 50s or the new 30s, I feel like uh, there's not really any difference between young and senior <laughs> myself. Touché. <laughs> Look, I think what you may 
be ex reflecting is that there was no critical mass of women 20 odd years ago and for a woman to succeed then she probably did have to be a bit like Ginger Rogers had to be twice as good as Fred Astaire because she had to do it all on high heels and backwards. <laughs> women who wanted to succeed in senior roles 20 years ago had to be more men than the men mm. in order to show that they could do it and if that meant being an aggressive, uh, hard to work with, uh, bossy person, rewarded as it was in men, uh, not liked in women, that was probably the only model really that was available. I think now there's such a diversity of leadership style that's recognised and rewarded and actively sought out and I think of all of the highly competent and diverse women in leadership positions across the public sector, we don't at all feel the need to fit into a stereotypical masculine uh, model and I know that the, the EL women I talk to around the department and who comes to the Women's Network, they completely feel that they ought to be able to be themselves as they move into more senior leadership roles. It's very encouraging to hear. Uh, Marion. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Marion Saw from the Australian National University. Um, I've been enjoying this panel and, and hearing a lot about organisational culture. I suppose what I'd like to hear a little bit more about is emotional work and the kind of emotional work which is needed to sustain organisations, which frequently used to be done by women in organisations and therefore wasn't defined as part of leadership, but of course should be seen as a very important part of leadership, the kind of emotional work which does sustain organisations. So I'd like to hear a little bit more, I think, from panel members on this subject of how this is conducted. Well, thanks. Thanks, Marin. That's a fascinating question. Who would like to pick that up, the emotional work? I'm happy to make a start, but others may wish to say things as well. Um, it is important to pay attention to how people feel about work, and one of the jobs, I think, of a senior manager is to have networks in the organisation that allow you to do that, to be able to get an honest flow of information about what's really going on and how people are really feeling about it. Because one of the things that um, can happen as you become more senior in an organisation is um, the people who meet with you are more inclined to filter information, to put a positive light on it, to not say difficult things, because you know, they want you to hear the good side of things. But if people, staff at any level, are worried about issues or concerned about them, it's better that you know it in order that you can address it. And so what, what I strive for is um, an honesty in the communication that means that somebody can come through the door and talk about, uh, talk negatively about how they're experiencing the workplace and know that they won't get their head bitten off. But uh, you know, I've got a rule for myself, I thank them for bringing that message to me and then work out what we're going to do about it. And I usually invite them to make a suggestion about what might be done as well. So I think you know, the emotional side of things is important, being in touch with how people feel, to me, is important to success in an organisation. I think Martin wanted to say something. Is that something, uh, Martin or, or Tony or any of the um, panellists, is that something that is, is prominent in your thinking as a leader of a department, the emotional intelligence and how the emotion of a culture is handled? Very much so. Um, uh, I, the last thing you want is to be, well, the last thing I would want is to be in an organisation where the leadership team is aloof. Um, uh, my, personally, my ideal um, leadership style fits my personality. Uh, I can't do it now but because of the nature of the job, but is managing by wandering around. Um, and you pick up the pulse. So if you can't manage by wandering around in the same way um, because the span of control gets so big, you've got to find other mechanisms. Um, you've got to have trusted confidants around the department at different levels um, who you know will give you feedback. And there are people in this room who have worked for me in different, um, in different organisations who I can say um, have played that role. Uh, and they've been very frank. Uh, and that's, that's absolutely critical. Uh, I think Jan is entirely right, which is if somebody does come to you with a problem, 
then the first thing you do is you thank them for bringing it to your attention and then you try and work out how you deal with it. Um, the other thing, and, and this is a personal um, preference issue, uh, I've, I've tried to, to do a lot to break down the, the distance between me as secretary and the staff. So I'm Martin, um, I'm not Dr Parkinson or secretary. That, that, that happens to be my personal style, it's not everybody's. Um, I chat to people in the lift. Um, again, that's not um, my style. Uh, sorry, it's not everybody's style. Um, how did I go about that? Well, basically, uh, you show the staff some of your humanity. So everybody in the Treasury knows that I'm a mad keen Essendon fan. Um, and so what we've done by doing this is we've created something for anybody, and, um, and that is men and women, who know something about me and they can actually raise something. It can be as simple as, oh, your team didn't do that well on the weekend, to, oh, your team didn't do that well on the weekend because the drugs didn't turn up, <laughs> depending, <laughs> depending on how... Could I'm, be true, though. Could be true, de depending on how um, uh, assertive the individual is. And I can assure you I can see no difference between men and women and particularly no difference between young men and women and how they're interacting with me. Okay. But that's a personal perspective. Right? Uh, do we have another question from the audience? We do just over here. Um, Marianne Cullen from the Department of Broadband Communications and the Digital Economy. I'm um, a minority. I'm one of the 4% of the SES that work part-time. And not only do I work part-time, I only work three days a week and I'm at the band two level. Um, but I have to say there was a little bit of resistance to me returning from maternity leave with that arrangement. And given that some of the um, lack of confidence research seems to, it seems to be around um, women being torn at the family, how to manage the sort of family responsibilities, a lack of role models. Um, and I think we do it pretty well for EL2s and, and EL staff in terms of getting that family flexibility. I'm interested in the sort of practical things that you, you're doing in your agencies to overcome that perception about needing to be there 24-7 and about, um, or being, you know, maybe not there 24-7 but available 24-7 and the practical things to help with family commitments. It's a great question and uh, a very good point to raise given four or five percent only of SES women using that flexibility. Because we're running out of time, I'm going to ask you to answer that very briefly, just one or two quick practical uh, messages. I mentioned that, uh, that our CEO treats uh, his executive with uh, a great amount of flexibility around uh, family. I've got four daughters between three and 12 years of age. Uh, so whether I've got caring responsibilities for them, school drop-offs, uh, and so forth, there's never any question about being able to avail of all of the uh, flexibility and leave arrangements that apply. But also the CEO very specifically does not, um, unless absolutely necessary, contact any of us out of hours. Now I know that he sees what I send him out of hours, but he never responds out of hours. There's a very deliberate um, setting of the tone that he does not have the expectation that we should all be kind of constantly on the, uh, mm. on the wheel. Mm. And we're lucky enough to be, the, I guess, the sort of organisation that doesn't necessarily require that. Mm. Interesting. Renee? Uh, so I think that part of it's attitude. You have to have attitudes that you inculcate and expect throughout your SES that you'll uh, be flexible and adjust depending on the job and the role and the, the demand rather than one, everyone is 24-7. And I think that the person in the position of working part-time, and I've, I'm a single mother and I've worked part-time after both my maternity leaves, so you can do it. Um, but is also, we should ask for what we need. And so, you know, PMNC does work long hours as needed, mornings, nights, whatever. Um, I say, and Dr. Bot accepts, that if I can't be there in person, I'll be there on the phone or I'll be there online. And if I can't be there, actually I've got a team of talented and competent people who can be there for me and that we all ought to just be able to work around that. And I think if you've got an organisation that has the right attitude, you can make it work. And then you need some structural things to back that up. So things like if you're working part time, have someone who does your job the other two days, otherwise you end up doing your whole job. Mm. 
in mm. three days. Can, um, can I just ask you, Renee, on this issue of perception, though, um, women feeling that they are being penalised or feeling that they are being um, looked at very negatively because they're taking a flexible arrangement uh, option, how do you deal with that, that perception? Is, is, should the women themselves t try to stop feeling so um, concerned about that? We could have a long conversation about guilt and work and life, but we haven't got time for that. Um, partly you do have but it, to... Well, I guess what I'm getting at, sorry for interrupting, but what I'm getting at more, is it more a perception thing on women's part? Is I think it, it depends that, on that, the organisation. Guilt thing. Organisations that are properly implementing and encouraging flexible working arrangements, the women won't feel they're being penalised because they'll still get promotions and they'll still get sexy, exciting task force work. And I know the SES women who are working part time in our organisation are not short of work and profile. But if you're in an organisation that is giving you a bad message about it, you'll certainly feel it and you'll worry about it. Mm. So I think it's an organisational responsibility to have the right culture. Okay, Jane. Um, I think it's important to understand the circumstances of your staff and be willing uh, to have a conversation with them about uh, how you best work with their circumstances and I think it's also important as a senior manager to model uh, flexibility. So for me, I have a, a property at Braidwood, I spend weekends there almost every weekend, head out there Friday night, come back Monday morning straight to executive board. Yes, I do check my BlackBerry over the weekend. Yes, I may send emails. I am available, but I model that. My staff at various levels know that I do that. They work with me on that. I've supported SES officers working part-time. The world hasn't come to an end. In yeah. fact, uh, they're very, very productive. It's a mindset thing, I think. Mark. Uh, about, uh, Marisa will correct me, about 10% of our SES and about 20% of our EL2s work part-time. Um, uh, we've probably made it harder than we needed to. One of the things that came out of the work that uh, we did with Deb um, was a recognition that um, we'd been really good in encouraging people to work part-time. Um, we'd done nothing to redesign the jobs to make the jobs part-time. So we had people doing full-time jobs in part-time hours. I think the other thing that um, is important is trust. Uh, often it seems to me that people are working part-time because um, they haven't been trusted to be paid to work full time three or four days in the office and one day at home. And I think technology can really help us there. So uh, I, I just think you know, we've, we've just got to be constantly looking for innovation and flexibility and that's inevitably going to be the way we'll go. And um, you know, your own department and the Public Service Commissioner have been encouraging teleworking and the like, so I think that will actually help over time. Terrific, thank you. Unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there because uh, we were going to end this panel at 1.30. Now it's nearly 2 o'clock. We've gone on and we could keep going on. There's so much to talk about. But uh, I thank you very much. I'm going to call now on Mark Evans to, uh, to close uh, and summarise and close today's event. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, Virginia. Um, and the panellists for, uh, for a wonderful um, um, discussion. Um, I think everybody's sort of noted almost at the outset of um, all of their contributions that, uh, that the Australian public sector has performed better than the private sector on gender equity outcomes. But at the same time, everybody's always said, also said, but. We've always, always had the but afterwards. Um, and it's quite clear that the, the gravity of evidence in this report, um, the evidence presented on, on geoscience as well, um, clearly demonstrates that a fully effective APS that reflects its stated values won't be attained until there is 50-50 men and women at the senior levels. And only when unconscious bias is elimin eliminated can we say that the merit principle for appointment to senior positions applies. And the evidence suggests that that is going to be an ongoing struggle. Um, the phrase, merit doesn't look like me, is a crucial way into thinking about that problem. In the same way that in, in other research that we've, we, we've done recently, that uh, not taking leave right, and, and the amount of overtime you're due is viewed as a badge of honor. Um, and actually, there's some interesting insights there for, 
for any government that wants to make any efficiency savings to actually enforce a diversity approach in terms of their workforce. Um, as Martin and Jan have, have both noted, in addressing this issue, the APS will meet, need the committed um, support of APS leadership, leadership, most of whom are men, and the role for these men if they are serious about pursuing an inclusive culture, will be, as our report states, and Meredith said earlier, to lean in and listen. Um, as Australia's Sex Discrimination Commissioner has observed, when men do listen to other men, so it makes sense to me that men must take the message of gender equality to other men. Um, the strategies identified in the report and also by a number of the, the, the panelists suggest that you actually, this is another area where you need a systems model of behavioral change that stresses the need both for leadership commitment to put into practice a culture of inclusivity. Um, but that commitment needs to go beyond individual measures to the in, in, introduction of systemic organizational um, reforms that change behavior. Um, this wouldn't only just benefit women, but it would also benefit a significant number of men as well. Um, it would also assist in removing the cultural and organizational biases that are making it so hard to attract and retain other minority groups. So in short, gender equity has to be a prerequisite for meeting broader diversity challenges. And as Jan said, it's now time for decisive action. So looking at, in closing now, I would obviously like to take this opportunity to thank our eminent panel for being so open and, and frank um, about the challenges that they're confronting. Um, also our, our wonderful facilitator, Virginia Hausager, um, who has been such an eloquent and inspiring champion for this project right from the beginning. Um, we wouldn't got anywhere without Virginia's support. Um, and... Um, I mean, what a politician she would be. <laughs> anyway, um, and also, of course, <laughs> to you, the audience, um, for your great participation as well. I hope you've enjoyed this event. Um, there will be another two parliamentary triangle seminars this year, and we look forward to inviting you all to, to other important discussions that we'll be having on critical governance problems in Australia. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>